In this video, we're going to take our first look at a reasonably complex algorithm. So first of all, an algorithm uh, has a technical definition, but basically it's a way of solving a problem that happens in a finite amount of time and gets to a definite answer. Um, an example that's often used to illustrate algorithms is sorting because that's a task that has to be done all the time. It's very common and there are lots of different ways to do it. So we're going to look at a simple sorting algorithm and we're going to start building on um, a method for finding the smallest element in an array. Now if you remember when we were looking at reading from files, we found the smallest element in the file and this is going to look very similar. So okay, what we're going to do is start out with our first element and that's the smallest so far. And then we look at each element in the array, starting with two and going to the last index, and test and see if it's smaller than the one we've already got as the smallest. Then this is our new smallest one. And we keep going till we've looked at all the elements. And at the end, this variable min, well, its value will be the smallest element in the array. Okay, now in order to do sorting, we not only have to find elements, we have to move them. So what we want to do is find the smallest element and make it the first element. Now, um, to do this, we have to know what is the index of the smallest element as well as the value. So to do that, we'll make a slight modification to the code. And, as long, and along with keeping track of what the value of the smallest element is, We'll also keep track of its index. So initially, before we start looking, when we look at the first element, it's 1. And then as we go through this loop, looking at each element, um, if we find a new minimum, we're going to set the value and also the index of where we found that element. OK, now we want to switch the values of the two variables. Now I showed you this early in the term, but in case you forgot, um, if we have two variables and we want to switch their values, this is kind of natural code to write, but it doesn't really work. Because once you do this first assignment statement, you've wiped out the original value of variable A. So you're going to end up with both of them equal 4. In order to really switch the values, um, you basically need a place to store the value of one of the variables while you write over it, and then you can bring that value back. OK, so this one works. and it exchanges the value of var a and var b correctly. So now using my array, here's the code I was just showing you where I start with the first element and its index, go through and find the new min, if there is one, um, and reset these values. So when I'm done, I know that um, the min index is the index of the smallest element. And then what I do down here is, using the method I showed you on the last slide, I exchange the values of the first element, data1, with element data min index, using this variable temp as an intermediary value. OK, so doing this, I'm able to find the smallest element in an array and make it the first element. And then whatever was the first element goes into its place so I haven't lost any information. OK, now here's my idea for sorting. Find the smallest element and switch it with the first one. Then, in what remains, find the smallest remaining element and switch it with the second one. And keep going until you get to the end. This method actually has a name. It's called selection sort. So here's how it works. I've given you an initial array. And in the white, I've given the values of the elements. And in the gray area are the indexes. So if I look at these, the smallest value is 2, and it's in index 3. So I want to switch this element with element 1. And after I do this, I get this. And I've colored the first element because I now know that the smallest element is the first one, and I don't have to actually look at that anymore. So now what I'm going to do is look at elements 2 through 5. And the smallest one is now in position 5. So I'm going to switch that with position 2. Here you see it done. And I now know that these two are in order, and they're the two smallest ones. And I continue like that. Here the smallest element is again in position 5. I switch it 
uh, with position three and I get this. Now I need to switch the last two. And once I've done that, I know I'm done because there's only one element left. It's got to be the largest one. So the structure is, first we want to look through the whole array, find the smallest one, and switch it with the first one. Then look through the remainder of the array, find the smallest one, and switch it with the second one, and so on. So if you're looking at the whole array, it's a loop from 1 to n. If you're looking at the whole array minus the first element, it's a loop from 2 to n. Then we'll do 3 to n, and so on, till we get down to the last two elements, n minus 1 to n. So, a loop from 1 to n looks like this. A loop from 2 to n looks like this. So what we need is a loop that goes from j to n for each value of j going from 1 to n. Okay, well I can do that by wrapping this in another loop. So here's what my structure is going to look like. I'll have an outer loop that goes from j to n minus 1. And each time I'll start looking at element j plus 1 to n to find the smallest one and switch it with element j. Okay, so here's the actual code. So again, I'm going to start with j and go to last index minus 1. This is like, um, if you remember, when we get down to just one element left, there's no work left to do. So that's why we go to last index minus 1 on this outer loop. So what we're doing here is looking at element j. Initially, it'll be element 1 and its index. And then let k go from j plus 1 to the end. So initially, k will go from 2 to the end. Then when j equals 2, k will go from 3 to the end, and so on. Uh, looking for an element that's smaller than the jth one. And if we find it, um, we keep track. And we keep going till we've got the actual smallest one in element min index. And when we have that one, we switch it with element j using the temp variable as an intermediary, the way we looked at. Now, there were some tricky bits. I don't want you to think that somebody just sits down and writes this code without thinking. Uh, typically, to implement any kind of reasonable algorithm, you have to actually think. And so, for example, uh, the plus 1 and minus 1 in the loop limits, um, this, that this should be a minus 1, that this should be a plus 1, uh, typically takes some work to figure that out. And you also have to think about what happens if you give it um, an array with just one element, with two elements, even with no elements. Is the code going to work right, or are you going to get a runtime error? Um, what if the data is already sorted? Interestingly, there are some algorithms that work much better on unsorted data, some that work much better on almost sorted data, and so on. So, okay, let's look at the demo here. And... Um, that is called simple sort, and it has a data file to use. So I'm going to read the data, and um, okay, I'm going to find it in here. Uh, here we go. And here it is unsorted, and now I'm going to sort it. You see it's sorted now. And if I go over and look at the code, Okay, view the code here. Um, you'll see that this is basically, this reads the elements using our typical way of dealing with files, which you're familiar with now. Um, and here's where I print the array in the list box. And here's where I sort the array and print the result. And you'll see that the sorting algorithm is just about exactly what I just showed you on the slides. So um, this is fun to play around with. Change the data if you want to, um, the data file, and try it again. Make sure it really works. OK, now, there are actually many, many ways of sorting items. And in fact, um, here are the names of some well-known methods. And uh, in the next lesson, I actually am going to show you a number of these methods. I have them implemented, and I have what I call the sorting sampler that you can use to try different methods and see how they work. Now, why are there so many methods? Well, because there's different ones better for different situations. So if you only have a small amount of data, let's say up to a couple hundred items, the best 
best method to use is probably the one that's easiest to program. But when you have a large data set, speed becomes an issue. So an interesting question is, um, how long is it going to take me to use a given method to sort a given amount of data? Now you could time things with a stopwatch, but that's very dependent on your computer and the chip you're using and um, different local conditions that wouldn't be general. So a nicer, more general way to consider this question is to look at what kind of functional form does the time have. In other words, is the time proportional to the number of elements, maybe to the square of the number of elements? Um, actually, a good sorting algorithm uses time proportional to the number of elements times its logarithm. So just to give you an idea how different these can be, I've graphed these two kinds of times, uh, just the basic uh, function. So for n squared, this is the graph. This is the one for n times log n. This is the one for plain old n. Now you notice this scale is a lot bigger than this scale. So if these were both on the same scale, this blue line would be a 45 degree angle. So you can imagine this one's growing quite a bit faster. This one's growing extremely fast. And the thing I'm trying to show you here is that by the time I'm getting any number of elements at all, this one's growing so fast that pretty soon it's going to become impractical. Um, so what about the sort method we, we just looked at? Well, if you think about it, on the first time we do the loop, we do n minus 1 comparisons. Oh, and we're going to do this by looking at how many comparisons it does, because that's a good stand-in for how many um, operations the algorithm does altogether. So we do n minus 1 comparisons, then the second time we do n minus 2, then n minus 3, n minus 4, uh, down to 1 on the last one where there's only two elements left. So if we add this up, it's equal to n squared minus n divided by 2. Now, this one starts with a power of n squared. That's going to grow so much faster than the n that before the numbers get very big at all, this one totally dominates the time. So we can see that the time is proportional to n squared, and it's actually too slow to use on large amounts of data. Okay, now let's step back for a minute here. Um, algorithms are really important, and as a matter of fact, right now, you know most of the basics of programming. There's only one big concept we haven't gotten into, which is linked lists, uh, but you know the basics. Um, you know, assignment statements, conditionals, procedures and functions, loops and arrays, etc. But this is just like knowing the rules for a complicated game, like chess or Go. Sure, you know the rules, but you don't know anything about the strategy and the tactics. You can't really win against a, um advanced player if you only know the basics. And it's the same thing with programming. You know the rules, but you don't know the tactics and strategy. Those are the kind of things you learn in the more advanced courses. So you're really just at the beginning. Algorithms are the tactics, if you want to think of it like that. And there's a whole field called software engineering, which is about writing large programs, um, having different people work together so, so they do the program correctly, um, how you divide up the design, how you divide up the work, all that kind of thing. And um, that is a whole stu another study in itself. So I just want to say there's a lot more to this than what we're getting in this course, and I hope you'll be interested enough to uh, pursue some of it as time goes on.